Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Brain Food Show podcast. Uh, show and podcast because we go live on YouTube or we broadcast on YouTube. And then we also have a podcast version that comes out later. I am one of your hosts, Simon. Join with me today, as always, Davin, who for the longest time, I mispronounced his name in my mind as Davin. <laughs> and it took a long time getting used to the fact that your name has a soft A. But then everyone else calls you mm -hmm. Dave <laughs> on the comments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How's it going? It's going. <laughs> this is a long one. Yeah. Let's, uh, I've got my coffee. I've realized I've just sat down to do this. And it's just the time I normally eat lunch. And I haven't eaten lunch. So uh, by the end of this, I'm going to be pretty hungry. Uh, let's, uh, where are we starting today? Got a quick fact. But it says in the little document we've got here, the not so quick fact. <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, yeah, it's I'm not sorry. I should do my podcasting duty. Have you left yeah. us a review for this show? If you haven't, so, yeah. you know what to do. Leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. We're giving away an Amazon gift voucher to whoever gets lu randomly, luckily selected from the wide array of reviews on different platforms, not just iTunes, but when it gets to a thousand reviews on iTunes, we're gonna go through all of those reviews. And we're going to find someone who's going to win a thousand dollar Amazon gift card. So if that's not a reason to give us an honest review of the show, it doesn't have to be five stars. Although, you know, we like that. <laughs> um, please go do that. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Is there anything else I need to plug? I mean, I've no. got Skillshare later. Look forward yeah. to that, guys. Um, yeah. No, we good? No, good for now. <laughs> not so quick fact. Take us away. All right, so have you ever wondered why our tires, car tires, why are they black when rubber is naturally white? Only sometimes? every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, and some people might, <laughs> some people might not even realize rubber is naturally white because most rubber products, it seems like they're black, right? Like a lot, right? I or they're colored so. in some way. I feel, I thought it was whatever the color of rubbers is, you know, on the top of a pencil, it was that kind of... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Like um, whatever they call it. Pinkish color. Pinkish red. Yeah, pinkish yeah. red. I thought it was that for the longest time. Because <laughs> you know it. Turn and that's what a yeah. rubber is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it turns out it is actually white, but tires, of course, are black. Although in the old style, they did have those white tires or the white wall tires at some point, um, which are still kind of a thing. Nowadays, to have the white ones, I feel... Yeah, but... In rap videos, they talk about white walls and stuff and... Yeah, but you don't really want those uh, for, I mean, besides the fact that they'll look dirty like in two seconds if you actually drive them around. But no, like so in... Would look, would look a bit weird on my regular car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in the 1900s, early 1900s, there was a company called Binney and & Smith, and they made a product called Carbon Black, which was purchased in mass by B.F. Goodrich for incorporating into the rubber tires. And before this, all the, all the tires were white. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so just for people who don't know, carbon black is it's uh, nearly pure elemental carbon that's just in a, in a solution. It's a colloidal particle form um, and just made, there's various ways to make it. Um, classically, you had like stuff like they would char like the organic materials and stuff. So you had like ivory black where they would literally just char ivory and lamp black, which is just from the soot and stuff from oil lamps. Um, but more commonly, like you have like thermal black um, today, which is made by natural, natural gas. They kind of shoot it into this very hot furnace. Um, and then, you know, it produces carbon black and hydrogen. But so why did Goodrich actually want this in their tires? And it turns out it's not really clear who first discovered this. But uh, if you add about 50% by weight of carbon black to um, the latex, the rubber, uh, it ends up increasing the road wear abrasion and tensile strength by over tenfold. Uh, so makes a really crappy tire not so crappy. Um, and I did. That's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a ton. And uh, uh, it turns out um, today, so various tire manufacturers, they use different blends and stuff for different types of tire and everything. So today, according to Michelin, at least their average is more like 30% rather than 50% of carbon black. And then they use a lot of other things uh, for different things. But um, so the advantage of this, not only that, oh, I uh, increasing... Say, I feel like there was a time in history <laughs> where like a lot of stuff was made by just people randomly, like you say, they don't really know how someone figured this out. I feel like for a long yeah. time, science was just, let's mix things together and see what happens. This, this whole episode is just like, let's mix things together and see what happens. And then, you know, if you do it long enough, something happens. And it turns out, uh, I'll get into uh, shortly, this one was just that. 
uh, they they didn't really know they were they were actually going for something different. But um, so just to quickly get back to the um, uh-huh. the other advantages besides this the extra strength and tensile strength and all that, it also helps conduct the heat away faster from the hot spots of the tire. So the part that's actually on the road and everything also reduces um, uh, UV damage from the sun and all that. So and makes your tires look cleaner because if you have white tires, they look really dirty really quickly. Um, and this was actually the point, BF Goodrich, in 1910, they were experimenting with different tire looks just to sort of uh, look and see different colors and different advantages. It's sort of a novelty item as well. And so while they were doing that, they came across... Size. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so they came across Silvertown rubber, which is actually something from Britain uh, in Silvertown, England. I have no idea where that is. Do you know where that is? I don't know, but I've realized everything in this episode has an insanely cool name. Thermal what? Black, Silvertown Rubber, Furnace yeah. Black. <laughs> yeah, Silvertown, England, that doesn't even sound like a town in England. You know, it should be, it shouldn't be like Silvershire or something like it that. Does like this, American, doesn't it? It does, Silver, doesn't it? Like from, you know, if there was a silver <laughs> rush, you'd imagine like Silvertown. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there was a chemist there called S. C. Moat who was working on. Uh, there's a there was a company called India Rubber um, there, and so he was working on it, and he figured out at some point to add carbon black a little bit, and it made it more of a grayish look to the rubber that they were making. Yeah, it's not really clear if he knew what this did other than make it gray, uh, but uh, that came to the attention then of Diamond Rubber Company, which was owned also by Goodrich, and so Goodrich then when they were looking for different different type of colors for their tires. They looked at this as gray, so it's different. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they started testing it out and seeing what it would, what it would do, and they quickly discovered... We're like, ooh, exciting, the color of rubber. <laughs> yeah, gray. And then, so yeah, yeah. When, they started, when they started using it on their tires, they found, wait a minute, these gray tires last, they're a lot more durable than our, our white tires. And so then they, this followed a couple of years of experimenting with this to see kind of how much what's the optimal amount of carbon black to add and like, you know, the different properties and stuff. Uh, and then they eventually came to the approximately 50%. And then the problem here was to add this to, to quite a lot of their tires they were selling, they would need like a massive amount of carbon black to mass produce. And so they needed, they actually looking for 1 million pounds of carbon black for annually to start. Uh, and there was no company that could do that except for Finney and Smith, thanks to their, they'd come up with a pretty innovative new process in producing carbon black a lot cheaper. So a lot, so a lot of people would like burn organic materials and stuff like that. And they actually came out with a, with a natural gas solution and um, to produce it in mass very cheaply. And so they could do that. Tons, by the way. I just looked that up because I had no idea how oh. pound that. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, it, uh, it's a lot. It's just a massive amount. Mess. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. So. Yeah. And so that so BF could just started introducing it first in their high end tires, and then uh, eventually it kind of caught on to there um, from other companies and stuff. And they also they got a huge boost. It kind of became ubiquitous after World War One, thanks to during World War One there was a zinc oxide shortage, and this was something that was added to um, to the white wall tires or the white tires that would increase their strength somewhat, not as good as carbon black, but uh, but during World War One the zinc oxide shortage because it's used I think it's used in like um, uh, what is it bronze or whatever. Um, and so they needed it for various things. So people just, everyone switched to the black tires and they were way better and no one's really gone back except for if you want to buy crappy tires that just look kind of cool until they get dirty two seconds after you drive them. I would just add, it is possible, uh, while we were talking about the color of tires, I looked yeah. up whether, you know, cause it's 2020, it's nearly 2020. Surely someone's mastered the color of tires. You can yeah. absolutely buy fully colorful, like neon style tires for your car. Nice you can just put on there i'm looking at an image now there's mm-hmm. yellow green bright purple um which i think would be my selection it looks uh I, i'd never do this but <laughs> it's quite cool. imagine then they probably have like better uh white white uh, rubber you know keeping it white and then just adding color mm-hmm. you know properties or something but um on, the, on that note, so you have a lot of t- uh, shoes have white rubber soles and stuff. Uh, and that there's actually, they usually used fume silica for that. And it has similar reinforcing properties to carbon black, um, but uh, not, it's not ideal for tires, except for wet surfaces. It's really good for wet surfaces, but um, has, uh, has some other downsides, but it works in shoes. I, um, lost, I, I had a problem the other day. I was driving on the highway and I must have hit a patch of oil or something. And it was really raining heavily. And I slid uh-huh. out like really? on, the, on, the, on the motorway. It was really intense. I mean, just for a second. And when I brought it back under control, my <laughs> wife was quite alarmed. <laughs> and I was like, Whoa, that was intense. It never happened to me yeah. before. Um, oh. but I, yeah. must have, I don't know. I must have hit a patch of oil or something. It was quite scary. Yeah. 
I could have used this. Or, or did, was, that, was like a puddle or like hydroplaning or something at all? Uh, not quite. You know, it's like, you know, it, I was going around a corner. So it kind of felt yeah. like as if just the traction yeah. control wasn't on or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, did I accidentally switch the traction control? <laughs> no, it's fully on. So, quite scary. <laughs> and it was really weird, but I think I brought it back under control largely because... And you're like, Simon Whistler, Fast and the Furious. <laughs> well, I think it's just because I played a lot of computer games. Like you, know, you drift <laughs> around the corner and then you yeah, yeah. Like really just carefully nudge it back in to bring the drift oh, yeah, like back into the straight. See, See, I grew up in the middle of nowhere and like gravel roads and everywhere. So we did that all the time just for fun. And like it, in the winter and like my driver's ed even, we would go uh, and the driver's instructor used to just randomly on the gravel roads, just like to pull the emergency brake. So the car would try to spin around and it was like a game to see if he could not like spin out because um, he would do it without warning. Like he just, he would just reach over and like, you know, get your is reflexes. Is that part of the test? Uh, <laughs> it was just good fun. And then like actually my dirt road, we had to, so they would plow like, one side of it when it's all snowy hmm. but then i found if you actually kind of embed your car halfway into the giant berm uh, it would kind of try to suck you in but then if you went really fast it would kind of try to throw you out around the corner you know and yeah. so there was just like a, a fun to see how fast you could go but you know it's a crappy car so who cares yeah, um, like the and there's no one else no, it's just, no this is in the middle of nowhere there's terrifying. there's no one like literally like an hour from anything remotely uh, resembling a city or town town really I, I also grew up what I feel, you know, in the middle of nowhere in England, but then it was like, yeah, oh, of course, yeah. you can walk 10 minutes and you're in the nearest village. <laughs> That's cool. No, it was like, it was like a 30, 30 minute walk to my bus stop so <laughs> for school. Um, but anyways, going back to yeah. Finney and Smith. So they didn't just help revolutionize the tire world by coming up with a way to mass produce carbon black cheaply, but they also sold the red oxide paint. They were the first company to, to sell the commercially sell the red oxide paint that would be the stereotypical barn color. So when you think of like um, barn color, you think of that like red or whatever, um, kind of like today, mostly people think of the, like the bright red, but you know, like the brownish red or whatever. And uh, it turns out before this, before the 19th century, the sort of rather than paint, so painting your house or your barn was considered a bit of like a you're kind of highfalutin and you know it wasn't obviously one thing farmers would want to do see farmer <laughs> yeah exactly and so they would just go with the whole uh, wood preserving philosophy of the right wood in the right place needed no paint so they would actually this was like a thing where you would decide the location of your barn based on the wind and the sun and uh, water exposure and stuff like that to help preserve the wood and the um keep everything going and plus at this time of course they had a lot more uh, heartwood and stuff from from the lots of uh, forests and everything being deforested really nice and that's forests with big trees <laughs> yeah exactly and so they were you know naturally weather resistant and that worked really good but in the 19th century that started not working so good because not as much of that and also they started thinking well hey what if we just paint them anyway or put some sort of finish and then the barn will last longer um so lots of homemade concoctions were come up with and the, one of the most popular was using linseed oil uh, mixed with um milk and lime or turpentine, apparently. And this would actually come up with that, I guess. Uh, and this would come up with a burnt lime, lime. orange Wait. color. This would be lime like builder's lime rather than yeah. food lime, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, you're talking yes. about milk. So, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's weird. Yeah, or turpentine is what they would use. And it, comes, it I don't even know would what come turpentine up. Turpentine is. I mean, isn't that sort of like a. I'm not. Turpentine. Uh, oil of turpentine. Uh, oils of turpentine. This is really helpful Google dictionary. <laughs> yeah, ah, distilled from gum, turpentine, or pine wood, used for mixing paints and varnishes. A volatile pungent oil distilled from yeah, gum turpentine. Huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is what they use. But the problem is, uh, the problem with this is it didn't. While it helped protect the wood, it didn't wasn't resistant to like mold and moss and things like this. That was you know would also degrade your structure. So then they figured out you could use iron oxide for this purpose to make some homemade paint with that. And iron, iron oxide is pretty abundant in the soil in parts of the U.S. So you could, I mean, it's literally like just get it out of the dirt, dirt cheap, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so. You could just mix that in, and then it would end up with this paint that was kind of a burnt orange or dark red brown. And so then enter Benny and Smith, who figured out a way to mass produce this uh, type of paint, and were the first to do so. This this color, this iron oxide, and that helped make it, um, thanks to its extreme cheapness and commercial availability and the utility of it, helped make it the gold standard for barns uh, all over 
And so well, that is kind of states, you know, we don't have red bonds. <laughs> yeah, I know. Do you, was it uh, blue? Was that the color? Yeah, they're just mostly, I feel like they're made out of bricks. Oh, that makes sense. I, 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 I Google searched it. I mean, I grew up around bonds and I kind of remember them just kind of being old brick buildings. Um, yeah, naturally. Nowadays, they're just made out of steel, I guess, or, you know, sheet metal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I looked up UK barn. It's mostly bricks. Mostly huh. bricks, sometimes wood. And now it's just mostly barn conversions, which are just, you know, nice big glass windows and stuff. Yeah. Well, in the US anyway, if you ask a kid to draw or to color in a barn in a coloring book, they're going to do a picture, some shade of red. And this brings us back to Benny and Smith again, because people are like, wow, Benny and Smith never heard of them. But what people have heard of is Crayola crayons, which is what Benny and Smith invented as well. Another product of theirs. Did Benny and Smith do the tires as well? Yeah. Well, I mean, they were the ones who came up with a way to mass produce the carbon black that made the black tires and mass uh, possible and cheaply. So they're essentially um, responsible for black tires, red bonds, and Crayola. And like lots of other things with colors and pigments, they were, they were super in, in, innovative in their, their techniques, the stuff they would come up with. So, I mean, because it's not like anyone, like super other people had the... Throw all this stuff together and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, other people had this stuff, you know, had carbon black and stuff, but they figured out ways to mass produce these things, which, I mean, you did that... Um, right. That, that mini documentary on pigments, how hard it was to, oh, yeah. to come up with. Just like the like, idea of blue in the 17th century yeah. was like, well, uh, we don't have that yet. <laughs> yeah, like not in a way that you could mass produce. Or, and if you wanted like the paint, like what was that one paint? The one with the blue lady or whatever paint where they had to get it only from Afghanistan or something yeah, like that? Like a mine in Afghanistan. And, and that was the only way in the world you could get it. And it was this just... really specific red. They made it out of beetles that came from like some South American island. And they just mm -hmm. ground up these beetles and it gave this, this one super popular red. Yeah. And so this is like Benny and Smith. They were just really good at coming up with these ways to mass produce these paints and colors and, and pigments and things that they would then sell to companies. And yeah, Crayola crayons. So that one, uh, it was around the early, again, the turn of the century there in 1900s. Um, that, was a good, that was a good time for Benny and Smith. Um, so they, they purchased a stone mill company because they were, they were going to make slate pencils and slate uh, supplies for schools. That was really popular back then. And so, but they, they wanted to develop other lines of products. So they, got, they roped in Alice Benny, who uh, was Edwin Benny's uh, wife, so one of the, the founders of the company. She was a school teacher at one point before they clearly were quite wealthy, so she didn't teach anymore. Um, <laughs> So all she was the whole tire thing and the yeah all, <laughs> well and all that yeah all these and they won like a lot of awards too uh, so they were at like world's fairs they won um what, what were those gold gold whatevers uh, gold medals at those that they used to Crayola crayons used to have that that logo on there from one of theirs and that was just one of their products so so yeah so they came up with a bunch of products uh, and so one of the first ones uh, was the world's first dustless chalk uh, so and uh, called chalk crayons is what they called them and that one was one that won a gold medal uh, at the 1904 st louis fair and then they came up with the wax crayon which they sold under the crayola brand uh, starting in 1903 and crayola was uh, uh, the name so that, that was actually thought up by alice binney and so it comes from the french word i don't know cry cray uh, I don't know. Sorry, I was looking up the gold medal thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. It is called the gold medal. Also, Crayola boxes look super cool in the past. Like yeah, a, yeah, like they a did. Certificate or something. Pretty excellent. Yeah, they look way, way cooler than now. Or they just, you know, whatever. They just put lots of, yeah. What was that word? Um, so Fr wow. French word, Cray. I, I know nothing about French, but I know you took like years of French. So. Uh, yeah, dude. But, you know, at school, I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> French was, uh, was by far my lowest grade at uh, GCSEs. <laughs> was it? Do you actually get like uh, props from your from your school because you're, you're British and you're like, yeah, we don't speak French. So like, if you get a lower lower grade, your teacher's like, yeah, good job there, Simon. Totally not. <laughs> well, that would be amusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but so cray like, meaning blemish it, didn't you, Whistler? <laughs> <laughs> Cray meaning chalk or with uh, Ola shortened from the uh, French word. I don't know. That's a lot of letters. <laughs> Oligno. <laughs> yeah, meaning oily is the point there. And it actually derives from Latin uh, ol oligonus, uh, which is the, um, which basically just meant olive tree. Uh, so then, then that all brings us to that. So that's the first part of the Cray. For and say Oligno. Yes, I do. I was, hang on. 
I don't know if you heard that, but he said, Ole as you know. Yeah. Oh, All right then. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. too bad. <laughs> yeah. So so Cray. Uh, it was the first part of Cray and, and Crayola. Um, so no, okay. I've lost Genius. my spot. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm not surprised you lost your spot looking at these notes. It's just a whole bunch <laughs> of random French words strung together with their meanings. <laughs> yeah. So crayon actually did exist before she came up with that, um, used for um, going all the way back to the 16th century, actually, and just went chalk pencil. And so if you put it all together, basically the point of all of that little sidetrack was that, that Crayola Crayon. The name of Crayola Crayon. <laughs> yes. Actually just means oily chalk pencil. Wait, um, so crayon which is, they made up. They made up the word no, crayon. No, Crayola was what she came up with, and then they used crayon. So crayon just meant chalk pencil, and it was all the way back to the 16th uh, century, which actually, in French, uh, it, it, in the French version, just meant pencil eventually. Uh, so it was just oily pencil or oily chalk pencil, which is a uh, apt description. Just, you know, yeah. Hey, do you want a pencil or an oily pencil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a Crayola crayon, which is a really that's a that's a good name. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they started making it just a wax thing. And they had actually previously made this for industrial use for like a company. And I found this funny because uh, so they couldn't use it straight off for kids because it had chemicals and had like toxic chemicals in these things that they were perfectly happy to sell to companies for their workers to use on like crates and barrels for marking. But you can't give it, you know, can't give the toxic chemicals to the kids. Oh, so they had to the kids would eat it or something. Uh, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, and then it's not like oh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a, a thing like the the 19th century it was just like whatever our workers are dying who cares we'll just that's replace right. them with new workers. It wasn't until like the you know the the early 20th century that all started to change. Found out we did the radium girls. Yeah, that one, that one, and then uh, Henry Ford had had a huge. Uh, about to do to the reduction of work hours and actually better conditions and factories and all that. Everyone kind of had to follow suit after his success. But up until then, it was scrappy. Henry yeah. Ford also started an American town in the middle of the Amazon rainforest called Fordlandia, where he roped in all the locals. Did you, do you know this? This was No, I don't know this one. Oh, dude. Uh, I did a business plays video about this, which is another channel I do. Um, dude, it would make a great today, I found out as well. He started this yeah. town in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. And he... <laughs> He's like Henry Ford, so he's like super Christian. He's really into these like American values of like poetry reading and pure tanity <laughs> or whatever that word is yeah. like back in the day. And so he builds mm -hmm. this, it's essentially just an American suburb in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. <laughs> then he says to all these, you know, locals, hey, come work in my, Amazon, uh, in my you know, American suburb in the forest gathering rubber, funnily enough, for his motor cars. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it didn't end well. Let's just put it that way. They were like, well, <laughs> this kind of sucks because we have to go to mandatory poetry reading and there's no booze. <laughs> <laughs> well, and was it in English? Did they speak English? Uh, I, I can't actually remember, but I, I could imagine it would be forced upon them. <laughs> yeah. No, I've not heard that one. That will be good too. Oh, to look into. It's, uh, it's one of my yeah. favorite random business stories. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. So... In any event, they came up with new uh, pigments and stuff. They, because again, they're super innovative. They're Benny and Smith, new pigments for their stuff, and came out with wax crayons for kids. And uh, their first, for anyone curious, their first, it was an eight pack of crayons that had black, brown, blue, red, purple, orange, yellow, and green, and sold for a nickel, which was a dollar fifty today in today's money. Um, so in today and deal. Yeah, and eventually they rebranded their whole company Crayola instead of Binny and Smith, which is why a lot of people haven't heard of Binny and Smith. And also Hallmark now owns Crayola. So Hallmark Cards Inc. They bought them in 1984. Okay. And I just there was another little aside here. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but also a connection, and I thought it was interesting because it's a little funny. Um, so Edwin and Alice Binney's daughter was named Dorothy, and she married a publisher named uh, publisher and promoter named George P. Putnam, who in turn had two children with her before she started having an affair with some South American guy. Funny enough, and then uh, uh, and then it does. This whole episode is so random, but also all ties together. Good. Even um, random aside seem to be pulled into yeah. the main subject. Yeah. It took a while, let me tell you. Um, so anyways, they get divorced because George Putnam, they eventually get divorced after a couple of years. He didn't really seem to care that she was having an affair. They didn't like each other. So they weren't, you know, didn't even really live together much. But he invited one Amelia Earhart over to live with him before they were divorced to help write a book. He was writing a book about her first trip across the Atlantic. He had previously... Um, 
done another one that was really famous for with an aviator. I can't remember the, um, now, but it was really big. And so that Amelia Earhart, he approached her and said, hey, you want to write a book similar? It'll make a lot of money. So she agreed. She comes, lives with him. And then they get pretty close. And so they live together. And then the divorce happens. And, uh, and then shortly thereafter, he proposes to Amelia Earhart. She says no. So he proposes again. And she says no. And this proceeds six times before she finally accepts because Amelia Earhart was very anti-marriage because at the time, if a woman got married, even if they had independence before in a career, it usually stopped right there. Like it was just that, that's it. Um, yeah. You're, you're a wife now, you, you know, make babies and, and like chicken, you know? <laughs> so that was kind of the thing. And so she was convinced this was going to happen. She was quite anti-marriage for this reason. And so at the point, I, th I just thought this was a funny letter. So on the day of their wedding, she goes up to her, her Mr. Putnam and she's, you know, they're about to get married, her future husband. And she gives him a letter uh, in which she writes, you must know my reluctance to marry. I feel the move just now as foolish as anything I could do. I know there may be many compensations, but have no heart to look ahead. Uh, on our life together, I want you to understand I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. If we can be honest, I think the difficulties which arise may be best avoided should you or I become interested deeply or in passing with anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> like, really She's like that. in love with someone else, or just it's someone you fancy. Just <laughs> yeah, that would that would be that would work out way better for us if you could just go ahead and do that. <laughs> but then she goes. <laughs> 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 Please let us not interfere with the other's work or play, nor let the other, nor let the world see our private joys or disagreements. In this connection, I may have to keep some place where I can go to be myself now and then, for I cannot guarantee to endure at all times the confinement of even an attractive cage. <laughs> <laughs> I must exact a cruel promise, and that is that you will let me go in a year if we find no happiness. I will try to do my best in every way and give you that part of me you know and seem to want. So this is both funny and also kind of like, it also kind of shows some of what her thinking because there... And you read some of her other, she definitely didn't, she was convinced, like, as soon as they were married, he wouldn't actually want her to be the way she is, you know, like that he would just be like, no, this is, you can't have my wife like going off and, you know, all these adventures and flying and dangerous things and just letting, you know, her be. But that, and there's that part where she didn't say I can go to be by myself, which is actually how I read it first. And so that's why I highlighted it, because she actually says I can go to be myself uh, somewhere else. And so, yeah, she was convinced, uh, that he wouldn't actually want her to be herself there. So, so she didn't also, hang on, am I reading this correctly? I think she means like, she just wants somewhere to go and be alone and have some solitary time. No, see that that's how I read it. But no, if you actually read the words, it's to be myself, not be by myself. She wants to go somewhere else to be herself so she can be herself. Cause she feels like in the marriage, she's not going to be able to be herself. Oh, that's it's a, kind of fascinating. That's a bit sadder. <laughs> It is. And that, that last line too, where she will try to be what, you know, but you know, he, she doesn't, she's not convinced that he's actually going to like her the I way she know, is. George. She said no five times. Yeah. And she, and this was, of course, she, the, part of the letter I didn't put in there was, she also explained, we've talked about this before and basically, and you kept asking me anyway. So I finally agreed. Yeah. Uh, so, so this, this was uh, also extremely odd for her time. She chose not to take his name, which was like, you know, really outlandish back then. They didn't bother to have honeymoon. They just got married and then just went right back to work. She just went off on a flight to her actually directly after. Uh, it all worked out though crazy enough. So she did actually eventually, you know, wait a minute, he actually did want, uh, he liked her the way she was, uh, even though she was a bit atypical for her age. Uh, and she states in a letter a few years later, I had no special feelings about Mr. Putnam at first. I was too absorbed in the prospects of the trip and my being the one to make it. Of course, after I had talked to him for very long, I was conscious of the brilliant mind and keen insight of the man. We came to depend on each other, yet it was only friendship between us, or so at least I thought at first. At least I didn't admit even to myself that I was in love, but at last the time came. I don't know quite I don't quite know when it happens when I could deceive myself no longer. I couldn't continue telling myself what I felt for GP was only friendship. I knew I had found the one person who could put up with me. Oh, that's nice. It all worked out in the end. It did. And uh, I did want to just, uh, just another great, great quote from her, just completely random a little bit. So after crossing the Atlantic solo on her, this was her second trip. Um, this was the first time to, to do it alone. And also became, she became the first person, man or woman, to, f to cross the Atlantic by air um, twice. And so she states of this, 
If there is anything I have learned in life, it is this. If you follow the inner desire of your heart, the incidentals will take care of themselves. If you want badly enough to do a thing, you usually do it very well. And a thing well done as a society is organized usually works out to the benefit of others as well as yourself. It's a nice quote. It is. And speaking of doing on, things well. On, just before we get there, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. I just want to take, go back on the journey of getting to that quote. Because <laughs> yeah. if I'm not mistaken, it was the Binny guy's daughter who married uh-huh. a publisher called Putnam, who uh-huh. later divorced her and got married to Amelia Earhart. And then we had a yeah. section about Amelia Earhart. Bravo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. thought her letter was kind of both funny and a little bit sad and like, I don't know, interesting. I find it interesting on all these, like one of my favorites, which didn't do well at all, and we should just do it in podcast form just to beat people over the head with it again, is the... Um, the uh, <laughs> the first time, let's go at it again. Just <laughs> I'm sure you'll find it more interesting the second yeah. time, but it would actually be more interesting in podcast form because I spent, I spent like a couple days reading letters between Napoleon and his first wife and they just like hundreds and hundreds of letters and it is great because it's totally humanizes so you read about you know you study napoleon and all these things he did you know military campaigns and that's and he, you know he's sort of this mythological figure but then you read his letters to his wife and then ex-wife and uh you know but they still were super close the only reason he divorced her was just because he needed an heir and she wasn't cutting it for that um so, the, uh, so but they were still like super close for the rest of their lives and this was a problem with his his like second wife because you know wow he really liked his first wife and they still hung out and like for a while they had to separate for a little bit because of that issue. Um, but they still wrote each other and this is where these letters come from. And it's just super humanizing and interesting just to read these, like his personal thoughts, you know, that he's, you know, these intimate thoughts to his ex, his wife and the next wife. And uh, it's, it's just Go fascinating. On, I think these historic figures, it sort of makes them like, Oh yeah, that was a real guy, you know, like, and you know, just, he's just like a normal guy in a lot of ways. Do you so, think it's like just fascinating. Years will be like reading, Trump's email, Trump's emails to his wife. <laughs> yeah. And it will be like, yeah. oh, isn't it nice to have, you know, he's so humanized the way he talks about, you know, dinner and all of this stuff. And I don't know, or do you think they'll remain private? Because I guess these letters weren't intended for them to be made public. And I think with my emails, yeah. after I really <laughs> like them to disappear into an oblivion of nothingness forever. Well, and that's you know, the funny part too, is that, well, because there'll be so many more because here's they, you know, there's these letters, but now, like, I mean, I don't know, I get like easily like 60 or 70 emails a day or something. Most yes. of them I ignore, but like, uh, most of them would be really dull reading. <laughs> Yeah, and so, but there's, it's just going to be drowned out, the ones I actually send. So even, even if someone were to, to read through them, it would just be like after like, all right, you know, 50,000 and whatever, you know, people would just quit and not, not keep going. But it would be, I think, I think it is, it would be like super interesting. And it's super interesting. Lincoln is another one to read some of his letters. And, and Lincoln, of course, had those ones where he had, he wrote those letters that he would then not intend to send. So he would write these letters, like these angry letters to people that were just like, not doing what they should or like this sort of thing like especially yet yeah it was just a venting and then it would just like he would just rip into them in every way possible particularly as generals and stuff who were completely incompetent like it was more to do with a lot of a lot of the the north's troubles were more to do with the general's incompetence of the north rather than the skill of the south generals they were just they were just skilled but like the ones in the north were, were really crappy and several times could have done something to to just like end the war and then they just didn't and lincoln would write these letters and they would just like rip into them you know what are you doing and uh, and then he would take that letter put it in his desk he's venting over and then he would write the actual letter to them which was very polite and just you know uh, much much nicer but kind of a nicer way to say some of the same things uh, and I, I don't know that's sort of super fascinating as well um, to sort of see that but in any event I thought all these things, all these letters like this, I, I think are interesting. And that, that's just a funny one to give your spouse or your future spouse on your wedding day, like even an attractive cage, yeah. you know, like it's not this is a cage. <laughs> no. But then he asked yeah. five times. Yeah, he must have really liked her, which we, she was a unique woman for her age. I mean, there wasn't a lot like that. I mean, even nowadays to, to you know, the, her accomplishments and all that, but still for her age, particularly a uh, unique personality. Should we talk um, about a sponsor and then get into our main content? We did. We should definitely. Skillshare, cause... right? Brought yeah. to you. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Do you know what Skillshare is? I'll tell you. It's an <laughs> online learning community for creators with thousands of classes in design, business, and more. You can get two months free trial. It says listeners here. 
for our listeners, but also if you're watching this on YouTube, you guys can also get it as well. How great is that? There is a link below if you're watching. And if not, you can just go to skillshare.com forward slash brain food. Maybe you want to become skilled like Amelia Earhart. Did she be mm-hmm. the first Pacific flight across the Pacific solo or Ad- the Atlantic? Atlant- uh, it wasn't the first solo uh, that was... Um... Oh, see, I'm, 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 Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh, yes. That, and that's the one that her, uh, her husband did the, the book called We, I think it was called. Oh, yeah. um, Dude, but she was, she was ties into our content today. <laughs> yeah, she was the first to do it twice over. The first time, ah, I think okay. she was just kind of a navigator or passenger or something like that. Uh, but she still got credit for being the first woman to cross uh, that way. But that's why she wanted to do it again, just to show, hey, I can do it by myself. I didn't need to be just a passenger. And so she did it solo. Um, and, yeah. and, you know. Now, look, I'm not saying that Skillshare is going to teach you how to do that. So that wasn't the best example. But <laughs> but as she stuff. says, as she says, uh, um, if you want badly enough to do a thing, you usually do it very well. And a thing well done as a society is organized usually works out for the benefit of others as well as yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, learn how to skills. do all of those things and get skills. Thousands benefit of- yourself and society thousands of classes, design, business, much more. Now, unlike some websites that I won't name, but I definitely know of and have used, where you go in and you're like, okay, well, I want to take a course on this and I want to take a course on that. And you have to pay for them individually. That's not the case with Skillshare. You get unlimited access. It's sort of like, I only ever eat sushi when it's all you can eat. Because if I eat sushi normally, you end up paying a fortune. You get like six pieces of sushi and then you're still hungry. And I guess it's also, I'm not extremely fussy about the quality of my sushi either. (laughs) But good news is that's not an issue with Skillshare because all of their stuff's amazing. It's like a buffet of courses that you can just dip into and access at any point. Recently, I took a course on better email management. Um, My inbox, like your inbox, Dave, and I imagine, also gets pretty out of control sometimes. It does. uh, It does. I, got, I went on Skillshare and was like, okay, I've got to sort this out. <laughs> and I found a course and it tells you, you know, how to set up all these different folders and systems and, dude, labels. Apparently that's a thing in Gmail. It's pretty epic. <laughs> uh, so now I'm labeling all my stuff. This course is, what was it called? I got it written down here. Yeah, email productivity works smarter with your inbox. It's by someone called Alexandra Samuel. I'd recommend checking that out. Uh, join 7 million other creators learning using Skillshare. And like I said, two months for free, skillshare.com forward slash brain food. You know, look, Skillshare's not going to tell you how to cross the Atlantic twice. And that's also been done loads of times now. So don't want it's to- really easy now. It just like costs like four yeah. or $500 and you yeah. can plane and go. Easy. And you get like in-flight food and you don't have to worry about icing and up and dying. So. Skillshare.com forward slash brain food. Two months for free. Just try it out. Why not? What have you got to lose? Uh, again, skillshare.com forward slash brain food. And let's get into our main content, shall we? Yeah. So today for the main content, we're going Dude, to be I talking. Like already, we, we must be like six hours in because that was the longest quick fact ever. Yeah. Well, as you, you'll see, the, the whole thing is, is around rubber, but this section is kind of about rubber bands and how we got there. Uh, so this various... Is We're making a video, a podcast about the rubber band. Next week, the cardboard box. (laughs) That's intricate. And you'll see, though, while we're all over the place here, it all ties together a bit like rubber bands hold everything together. And this is what holds this whole episode together. So Mesoamerican peoples, they made, they were making rubber. (laughs) Yeah, they were. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) They were. (laughs) <laughs> they were making rubber like 3,500 years ago. Um, so they would just mix, you know, they had the, the sap, the milky white sap, the latex from the Javia Brasiliensis trees or something. Yeah, that's ex- yeah ex- rubber ex- trees, ex- basically. Uh, so, and they would actually mix these with the morning glory juices from the morning glory vines and who, how they figured this out, who knows. Uh, but if you mixed them, it actually made a much uh, like a nice rubbery, solid, quite sturdy substance. And so the Olmec seemed to be the first to have done this and they did it because they would make these large rubber balls, which is, and they used them for these games. So they had these games. I'm not really clear what the exact rules of these original ones were. They had 
uh, over time there was various versions they even had like a hoop like type thing only it was like sideways eventually um that was added at some point for you know doing and uh, it seems like about this on top tens the other day really yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, and they're playing dude these games were extremely violent <laughs> yeah yeah and like could end with the death of the losers <laughs> yes or sometimes the winners they're not sure if it's the losers or the winners who were killed because it was seen as an honor like to not yeah. to die in it was either if you died like this or in battle then you'd go to you know whatever heaven they had <laughs> so yeah so there's like yeah you won <laughs> Yeah, they're going to chop your head off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they also did it. Apparently, it seems like they might have done it and stuff like, and they had conflicts with neighboring groups. They would just play these games instead of like warring with each yeah. other sometimes. Um, so, yeah. And it was also a good idea. You know, don't have a war, just get yeah. like a game of Commander Conquer going. And whoever wins, that's yeah. the winner. You know, yeah. Why, why yeah. So it's way more fun. Drones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but in any event, so so yeah, they had uh, and they made these rubber balls. Basically, this is some of the earliest use of rubber that they could uh, that you know we know of that humans made. And eventually, other older other cultures around that area and whatnot started making like sandals and uh, waterproof containers and jewelry and all sorts of things like that. And this is where we have a little aside here: dandelions. Did you know dandelions? You can get latex from from them. This is like is is dandelions considered a bit of a weed like in Europe? Uh, at all this is going to be really dumb but i just need to oh okay that's i was just double checking what dandelion <laughs> was because I, I got confused because they have the, also the uh you can blow on them right and then the seeds yeah yeah, there, yeah but they're also the yeah. yellow things yeah yeah I guess and this is like here they're here undesirable in a lawn yeah but... yeah this is what but there's so many uses to dandelions and it turns out you can get latex from them and this is going to be huge potentially uh so sort of like the Back for quite some time, people have been trying, can we, can we like make dandelion farms and then mass produce uh, latex farms? Because this is a problem nowadays because you have a lot of the, the, the latex farm, the trees are, are being killed off by diseases like in huge numbers and it's, it's really hurting the supply of latex. So natural rubber, which is a problem because even though like, I think it's like 50 or 50% or 60% or something is artificially made um, rubber, that we still, you know, the world still depends on these supplies. And so like the, it turns out the Nazis tried to do this. They tried to make uh, dandelion farms that could, they could then get mass produce uh, latex and they, they failed. And it's only been in the last few years. The Nazis didn't try. Yeah, they did try a lot of things. I mean, still, you know, anything that was in the war, they were like, yeah, let's try that. You know, yeah, just give it a go. Yeah, I, it's, yeah, one of those things like the Cold War or whatever. It's just like when you, when you give like a group of people like infinite money to just throw at yeah. the problem, or of course, then you just when like the to see what can happen. It's getting mixed in with the, you know, with, yeah. uh, with the military budget. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, hey, we should try this thing. Okay, here's $10 million. Like, you know, like uh, whether it's a good idea or not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so they tried, it's the last few years though, because of the, the problems with the, the latex, the natural latex supplies, uh, they're starting to put more money and stuff into this. And so now there is a cultivated um, type of dandelion that produces a lot more latex than, than the normal and all that. And it's starting. There's, there's some test farms going out to try to see. You can just have a dandelion farm, which is just crazy to think about and just to produce uh, natural latex. So if you do, if you do have dandelions Sorry, out, you can... I totally forgot. Why are we talking about latex? What does it do? <laughs> That's the rubber. That's the rubber. That's where we get rubber. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> I know it's similar to rubber, but I can't remember how we got that. No, like it, like it. Yeah, you'll see. You'll see why we call it rubber instead of. Um, okay. You sort of referenced it right at the beginning of this episode, but we'll we'll get to that. Um, than I know. Yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, so the uh, the. Uh, so this is a thing. And if you want, you can just take some, some dandelions, pop off the head, and you can squeeze the juices out. And then you kind of rub it together in your fingers. And the heat from your hand will, will help it bind together. And then you got a little bit of latex. And you can make little rubber bands and things. Not very good ones, but, you know. Huh. Uh, so, yeah, the Spanish explorers, they started they uh, started arriving in the 16th century, of course, and started looking and observing these, um, these little, them doing this, making these rubber products with their... Um, different things so uh, including the rubber balls and documenting the games but then it wasn't until french explorer charles de la condamine do you remember this guy yeah, from episode why? five okay yes he was the mathematician who figured out that he could rig the french lottery with voltaire oh uh, yeah 
<laughs> Wait, was this one of the adventures he went on after he got super rich? Yes, it oh, is. Awesome. And <laughs> this is this because he did. He did these these journeys to South America, which he could then fund himself because he figured out that he could get rich rigging the lottery, um, the French lottery, and that uh, also helped Voltaire. If people want to go, if you haven't listened to episode five, uh, that was uh, what was it called? Episode five: Enlightenment, Enlightened Rigging of the Lottery plus Wheezy Waiter interview. We had a interview with craig benzine that one that was good i remember we used um, to do interviews on this show like it was a yeah that was fun back in the day yeah i mean i've listened to a couple early episodes uh recently because i wanted to see like have we gotten better or like worse or you know like whatever and we've gotten better substantially worse no we've gotten substantially better let me tell you um but so the uh so yeah there was a couple of the early ones i was like oh really i haven't listened to this one though but it's really interesting so you should and and you know craig Craig Benzine, he's an interesting guy. And um, that's I do miss about the the interviews. It would be nice. It's it's fun to actually, you know, because if you if you're interviewing, you can just sing people. Yeah. Yeah. You can just be like, hey, you want to come on a podcast? And they're like, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah. In any event, so uh Charles de la Condamine. So he actually is often given credit for sort of discovering in quotes there, uh the latex and all that, because he he actually was the first to scientific do- scientifically document it in the seventeen thirties. So and he also brought samples back to Europe. Mm-hmm. Was the first to do that. And he also wrote the first scientific paper on it in seventeen fifty one. And he called it, I don't know, cat catchuic. It's a lot of vowels. Uh, I'm not even going to try. Let's yeah, it's a French. Chew it. <laughs> yeah, it's a French variation of the South American word for latex. And I don't even know what South American word, because obviously there'll be different words, different uh, based on the, who they were talking to, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. But either way, that's what he called it. And uh, so rubber, this brings us back to why do we call it rubber? Because shortly thereafter, in 1770, British chemist Joseph Priestley, who is the guy who discovered oxygen, among other things, uh, he noted that the rubber worked really good at getting rid of pencil marks off paper. And so by it's a rubbing material, and rubber, get it? So a name that would then catch on. And by the 18th century, this everyone was just calling it rubber for its ability to erase pencil marks. Um, so, it's weird there was a time when pencil wasn't erasable. <laughs> well, and the fact that pencil, I mean, pens, it, pencils were more of a recent thing. And um, oh, coming back true. to Napoleon. Didn't we talk about Bix last week. Yeah, but even before that, so you had pencils. Uh, it wasn't until um, Britain they discovered that mine that had the pure graphite where you could actually make the graphite yeah. sl- things and then they would wrap them in like sheepskin and stuff for strength and that they would like flood that mine because it's the world's only supply of these pure graphite and it wouldn't be till later someone i can't remember who i feel like working for napoleon or something yeah it was definitely a French uh, dude yeah it was figured out that you could mix clay because they were having trouble getting the supply from england obviously but napoleon wanted pencils <laughs> um so the uh he figured out you can mix clay and graphite <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my idea, my desire for pencils at the British are hogging <laughs> yeah. is large. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So this, well, I don't, I don't even know how did we even get here. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, this whole episode, I, it, it somehow ties together, but it's quite difficult to keep the flow. Yes, going back to rubber bands. Yeah. So rubber bands, eighteen nineteen. Mm-hmm. An Englishman by the name of. Talk, oh, I know. We were talking about erasers, pencil erasers. Oh yeah, rubbers. Oh wait, you know, yeah. Oh yeah, of course. You call them erasers, right? Yeah, rubbers. Rubber. If someone were to say, "Do you have a rubber here?" They would assume you meant condom or prophylactic. I guess is what would you call them? Prophylactic. What's a prophylactic? No, really. I so I saw this um, words, but I don't know what it means. That's funny because I saw this. Um, what's that? I don't even know. There was a show with the guy who plays on. Um, Harry Potter, the guy who plays Harry Potter is a uh, comedy show. He was just like guest starring on and he kept calling it a prophylactic. And I thought, is that how the British say that? Um, what is apparently it not. Isn't it something to do with allergies? I thought that was Condom. Like something. No, I, I don't know. He's obviously having you on because I've never heard anyone in Britain refer to a condom as a prophylactic. Yeah. Unless, that, what, show, this is something... what show is that? Um, one moment. Oh, okay. There we go. I took malaria prophylactic. So the idea of preventing disease. That would that be makes sense. Of usage. Okay. No, I've never heard anyone. If uh, well, Urban Dictionary. Should we Urban Dictionary it right now? Is this going to be good pod? <laughs> we can cut it out if it's not. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. Uh, Ricky Gervais, oh, the show. Yeah, okay. No, the, the extras of prophylactic. the extras. Oh, that's an old show. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, oh, wow. This Urban Dictionary definition was submitted in December 1999. Who knew Urban Dictionary had been around so long? And it, you know, it, it is a condom, a rubber, a Jimmy hat, <laughs> etc. So yeah, apparently I'm just out of the loop on that one. Yeah. All right then. Uh, yeah, but we would, uh, if someone said, oh, my aunt has this amazing story. <laughs> uh, we were, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's not American, but she lives in America. She's, uh, an immigrant and uh she's been there for i don't know what 30 years now 20 years maybe and we went over to visit her and go to disney like me my dad and my sister mm -hmm. and we went out i was maybe nine my sister was seven maybe a little younger and we were having dinner in a in a restaurant and you know how they'll like uh hand out drawings you know so kids can draw <laughs> yeah and my younger sister's like coloring in <laughs> in this american restaurant and she's just she gets really upset because she makes a mistake and she just starts shouting i need a rubber i need a rubber right now and my aunt's like please stop and my dad's yeah. just like i don't understand so like what's the problem yeah. she just needs a rubber <laughs> it does not mean that in the uk yeah. that's funny an eraser. Yeah. yeah yeah no yeah we would just say eraser i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In any event, going back to rubber bands, rubber and rubber bands, 1819, Englishman Thomas Hancock, he was in a stagecoach business, and he wanted to come up with ways to keep his customers dry while traveling. So he wanted some various, you know, uh, rubber based uh, waterproof clothing items. So he like waterproof suspenders, gloves, shoes, socks, among other wearables. Has he not heard of so like a roof? <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, you know, so, so I well, could either put something over them, or when they get in, they can wear all this yeah. complicated stuff. See, that's why when I was first reading, I was like, so did he just like like a tarp, like a rubber tarp type thing, like over the top of the stagecoach, right? That was, uh, okay, but you know, whatever. This was, I guess, there was a lot of them that didn't have, you know, they were open. Yeah, getting into uh, someone's sports car, and they, you know, it's just like, why didn't you put the roof up? Oh no, just wear this waterproof jacket. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It seems like there's a simple solution to this, but but you know he was you know marketing it too for beyond the stagecoach stuff, just uh -huh. for people to wear. Um, but so he opened a factory, begins mass producing it. But the problem is he discovers he's wasting a lot of rubber because uh, you know when you actually make the stuff, there's a lot of waste of material. So how can we recycle this? And so he came up with what a what he called a pickling machine, uh, later called the masticator, um, and it would just basically rip up and shred this rubber. And shreds, mash it together, be really malleable, and then it's it's like a solid mass, so you can make like sheets of, of rubber this way and to be reused, cut out, whatever. And also, one of his first things he made was these little uh, like these little strips of rubber that would made into bands. So we the first rubber bands, but he did not ever sell these or patent this. Um, he actually, at this point, didn't patent either, not even the machine, because he thought if he patented it, what's going to happen is everyone's going to patent trolls are going to come or patent uh, pirates are going to come along and they're going to just make my machine and start selling the product and force me to sue them, which is what always happened back then. Mm -hmm. And so then he's just going to spend years suing people and not making any money. And so he didn't patent the pickling machine. And so that hopefully that way no one would know how he did it. And he also called it the pitch pickling machine just to throw people off of like how it's how what does it actually do? You know, it's just sort of a random name. So people could and figure out how to work it or how it worked i, I like that idea isn't this is why coca-cola doesn't have a the coca-cola is not patented they had no patents on coca -Cola yeah because by keeping yeah. it secret they can use it forever yeah Which well yeah and expires after what well, and yeah, then, and then you give away the exact ingredients to anyone. And back then, this was like a thing that, as we've covered in the other stuff, this is just, just like, screw it. We're not even going to wait for the patent to expire. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll just do it. And then you can sue us if you find out at all, because especially if you were like in a different country, no one's going to find out, uh, which comes, we'll come back to Hancock because he was actually kind of one of these people. Um, so, uh, so he, do, he doesn't, he makes these rubber bands and this seems to be the first rubber bands that people made, but he doesn't use them for anything. He doesn't sell them, doesn't seem to see but to be fair, in his defense, they hadn't uh, come up with the vulcanization process yet. And so these, so rubber was really not a good product in a lot of ways at this time. So it was sticky mm -hmm. on hot days, particularly it would get sticky and you know, all that. And then on cold days, it would just get really hard and brittle. Um, 
So it wasn't very practical in a lot of sense, and it got really messy uh, over over time because it gets like progressively more sticky over time and stuff. So it wasn't it wasn't good, especially for these items. You have gloves that just start getting crappy over time. So this brings us to Charles Goodyear. So Charles Goodyear was born on December 29th, 1800, in New Haven, Connecticut. And he was the oldest of six children, and his father was a pretty successful businessman. Eventually, called Amasa Goodyear. Mm-hmm. And so he he got his start. His father did uh, you know, real success, I should say, in business because he buys this patent for manufacturing buttons. And at the time, in the U.S., manufacture in the U.S. was just considered universally crap and like stuff for buttons. If you wanted any product, you basically just bought it from Britain. Um, was right. the thing. Yeah, it was just Britain's where you get the quality stuff. Yeah. The U.S. manufacturing was just crap at this time. So he buys this patent for uh, manufacturing buttons, though, that actually made really good quality buttons. And so... Um, he opens a factory and then uh, he starts, he was the first U.S. manufacturer of pearl buttons in 1807. And during the War of 1812, it had risen to the prominence. Of course, you could imagine in the War of 1812, they're not going to want to buy Britain, uh, buttons from Britain. So the U.S. military was buying all their metal buttons from uh, Goodyear's father. Uh, so he was good business was booming. Business. And so, yeah, by the age of 17, uh, he, his father encourages Charles to move to Philadelphia to work as an apprentice at a hardware company called Rogers and Brothers. And he had an ulterior motive. He wanted his son to become an expert in you know, running a hardware company because that's something that he wanted his business to get into. Um, so then he comes back um, in around 1820 to 1821, sometime around there, to become a business partner with his father. And so then they actually switch to making all sorts of agricultural tools and stuff like this. And again, at this point, everyone was buying this from Britain. So to actually make it local was kind of a novel thing. And it's actually some, some say that Goodyear was the first to open a, a retail hardware company in the U.S. that was, like, was made the products here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, fully instead of just buying them from somewhere else and reselling them. Um, but either way, whether it was the first or not, he was one of the first. So, so here we are, 1824. Things are going well. He gets married to one Clarissa Beecher, and they reportedly had an awesome relationship and everything. And so his uh, business is booming, and he decides to open his own hardware store separate from his father's business. He's going to open his own thing. And this, again, is considered to be one of the first uh, domestic hardware stores in the U.S., and things are going great Where there. People buy stuff before, like online or mail order? <laughs> yeah, mail order to England. They would order it and then, uh, you know, various. Uh, uh, so, sarcastically, but no, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, you get it because England made all the great hardware, like the agricultural equipment and everything like that. You didn't want to buy the U.S. version at this time. Uh, so it was just, uh, you, you know, it was you, John Deere track. Is John Deere British? I feel like he's British. Is it? Isn't there a super British tractor manufacturer? I'm not even sure. Carry on. I'll Google it. <laughs> All right. no, so, yes. American company. There's a super British tractor company. And all the farmers who listen to this <laughs> will be like, Simon, how dare you not know this? <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Someone will tell us. Carry on. Wait, wait, wait. Useless aside. Marshall Sons and Co. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't know. Carry Anyways, <laughs> all right then. Uh, so, <laughs> I Google search famous tractor, and then you you know it auto fills. The first thing, not famous tractor manufacturer. The first option with famous tractor M is famous tractor manual, and I'm like, how many famous tractor <laughs> manuals are there? <laughs> <laughs> it's the international bestseller. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right. So again, the, the perception at this point was that you only buy the good stuff from England. So a company like this making all their own stuff in, in the U.S. rather than just ordering it and then because re- there were stores you could go to the store and they were just getting their product from England, you know. Um, so you just buy it. But now, you know, he, he had it all local. And so as the, as the 19th century is wearing on around this point, it's starting to wait a minute, you know, Charles Goodyear. He makes some awesome stuff. And so his business was booming. So things are just looking up for Goodyear. Like this, this whole first part of his life's super awesome. And then literally everything after is awful. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, for the rest of his life, leading to the, like the one, a super, super sad end. Like if you could think like, what's the saddest way you could go? I mean, sure, there's like lots of more sad ways, but he's, he's you know, it, it's sad. Uh, so what was that the, uh, he could, it, was he hung, drawn and courted? <laughs> No, so yes, that would be worse. But this is actually almost worse because that's like painful, but this is painful in another way. But anyways, we'll get to it. 
So that's a little teaser for some, make you feel grateful for your life. (laughs) Yeah. So good year. 1829. Uh, So he thinks, all right, everything's going awesome. And of course, everything up until this point in his life has gone awesome. You know, personal life, professional life, everything's doing great. Uh, So he's got enough money. He's going to, he's going to extend operations uh, outside of Philadelphia to start shipping his goods in mass to the uh, mid Atlantic and the South and everything. And so, but the problem is, the Tariff Act of 1828. And this seemed like a great deal for him because this was a way to get people to stop buying all their hardware and agricultural equipment from Britain was to put this like massive tariff. And it was, what was it? 38% on various imports from Britain and 45% on various raw materials. And that was like a huge... It's like you and Britain back in the day, you and China today. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, So this is huge. And so this seems like a good deal for, because now he's one of the, he's like with the top in the US, you know, he's got this hardware thing and now everyone, no one's going to buy it from Britain with that kind of tariff. And so the South, but the problem was, so all these Southerners were placing these orders that he was then fulfilling, but then businesses was not going well in the South because of this disruption on, on raw materials and all this. And so what ends up happening is that then a lot of Southern companies go out of business or they just choose not to pay, like they default on payments. So he's sending all this stuff, spending a lot of it capital to do it, and then not getting paid for a lot of this stuff in mass that he's shipping off. So this becomes a problem, a financial problem. Yes. And, and yeah, when people stop paying you. And so then at the same time, when he needs to be at the top of his game, he has this ex- severe extended bout with digestive issues, which causes him to be bedridden for quite some time. So he can't even manage his company effectively. And he's not, you know, obviously getting proper nutrition and sleep and all that. So he's probably not also, you know, top of his mental game either uh, running things. And so by 1830, he, this, this very prominent, promising businessman, just a couple of years before is now in debtor's prison. Uh, um, he's just like massively in debt. And then on top of that, just yeah, to just kick him while he's down. <laughs> it is such a weird, but this was, get all these people who owe us money and put them in a place where they can't earn money. <laughs> yeah. And when he was in debtor's prison, he did start his first experiments with rubber or well, one of his stints. He did several stints in debtor's prison. Uh, so 1831. So this just worse 1831 and 1833, two of his children die because that's what kids did back then. And his own health was continuing to decline at this point. It hadn't gotten better. Um, So at the same time, he decides, all right, he starts experimenting with, with latex. And he thinks, all right, my father takes this thing with buttons and makes them better. So I'm going to take a known product and make it better. And that's where I'm going to get my new fortune, right? So he looks at rubber as the way to do this. So there's tons of rubber product out there. They're all crap because eventually they, you know, turn crappy. They get really sticky mm-hmm. and when it gets cold, they're really hard and all this. So he's, if we can overcome this problem oh, and they also stinks like crazy, like the rubber manufacturing, like if you've ever, I don't know if people have ever like smelt this, but apparently it's really awful when you, when you smell the rubber manufacturing process. Never have the privilege. Yeah, no, I haven't either. But if you read accounts, apparently it's quite disgusting and you don't want to live near a rubber manufacturing plant um, either way. So he's, how can he... Have this place in London, which was a biscuit factory. I was like, oh, that's nice. I'd quite like to live next to that. Yeah. Also, yeah, there's a KFC this... near my house and I'm like, I'd quite like to live above that. <laughs> yeah, but that then you'd just be hungry all the time. If the KFC, yeah. that would be like, oh, KFC yeah, like, what about all the time. <laughs> yeah, KFC. Um, <laughs> So he look, he's looking to solve all these problems. So he buys, he, you know, he doesn't really have much money, but that doesn't, that's fine because it turns out at this point from Brazil for just a few pennies, which is about 70 cents today, um, you, could, you could buy a whole um, pound of this substance of this rubber that he could then work with. Um, so he starts doing this. He starts you working on it. Board, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he starts working on this and um, he's still, he's getting thrown in debtor's prison in 1834, 1838. And he's, he's not really making much headway. Like he started to make some different products like uh, tablecloths and shoes. And he was making, like he was mixing chemicals and stuff and getting, you know, he was finding these ways to make it better initially, the rubber, but it always would eventually like it would come in contact with this or that, that people that it would come in contact with, and it would revert back to being this crappy thing or even worse. Um, so, and one side thing, he actually did at one point add lamp black, um, which is, you know, basically carbon black, similar, uh, just derived from the, from the, um, the lamp burning process. And so he added this to the rubber to make any, he found it made it more desirable in some ways. So uh, all the way back then he was doing that. But, um, but this product, again, his mixture, it would ultimately break down, become sticky and lots of other issues that still plagued. And so he wasn't, he wasn't making money on this really. Um, 
And so at oh, one point, he, the neighbors, speaking of the smell, his neighbors called the police complaining of the, the foul odors because he was working like day and night. You know, he was, it was not like he was, wasn't working hard to try to support his family here, but it wasn't working out. He ended up having to sell like all their possessions and things like this. And uh, various investors along the way would come along. One of them actually that kept him afloat during some of the hardest times was one Jay Haskins from the Roxbury Rubber, who was also just a close friend of his and would just give him money. And then he had another business partner and things were looking up. He started his product was okay-ish, still not great, but you know, as good as some of the other rubber rubber manufacturers of the day. Mm-hmm. And so he opens a factory in Stanton Island with this business partner investor. And immediately after the financial crisis of 1837 happens, which results in a major recession and is his business partner going bankrupt and his factory then closing within months of opening it. Um, so his, his good year, he's not, he's, he's not, he's not unfortunate timing. <laughs> He just like, he keeps having this and so many failures. He finally, or 1838, Goodyear meets one Nathaniel Hayward who had worked. Hayward had worked and he'd figured out that you could actually um, sort of dry the rubber with sulfur, which would make it not so sticky. And it, I mean, it still smelled because now it smelled like sulfur, which is, I don't know, probably worse. I mean, sulfur is like one of the yeah, sulfur horrible like, smells. That's not, yeah. I feel like it's the worst smell. Isn't that what they used to make stink bombs? Yeah, that's like that rotten egg smell or whatever. So, but... They figured out this this seemed to to actually help the make the rubber stronger um, and less susceptible to temperature changes and stuff if you add some sulfur even so now it stinks so there's still it's like a new problem to overcome and also to find the optimal way to do this um, so Hayward and Goodyear they begin working together um, and Goodyear's bringing like he has massive experimental knowledge of mixing all sorts of chemicals with um, rubber which I should mention this uh, his health wasn't awesome through all this because he was mixing random chemicals, like just randomly with, you know, this is not a good idea if you don't, you know, if you're just like an amateur guy. And at one point he did, he almost suffocated and then got a fever, a severe fever directly after and almost died. Um, so yeah, but anyways, he had lots of experimental knowledge with rubber and so he's doing it. And eventually he comes up with the vulcanization process, which a lot of people say he stole from Hayward. But uh, for the record, in 1841, in a court case, Hayward himself would say, no, Goodyear came up with it, um, the exact vulcanization <laughs> process. So Hayward did not claim that Goodyear stole it from him. And uh, as for how Goodyear claims he came up with the vulcanization process, mm. uh, he writes in his autobiography, which is weirdly and awfully written in the third person, which just makes it like, Weird to read. Mean, yeah, I, <laughs> it does. It is very strange on many levels. But but this is Goodyear writing about himself. He's just writing about himself in the third person. So he starts off. The inventor <laughs> made experiments to ascertain the effect of heat on the same compounds that had decomposed in the mail bags and other articles. He was surprised to find that the specimen, being carelessly brought into contact with a hot stove, charred like leather. He. This is so strange. <laughs> he, he directly inferred that if the process of charring could be stopped at the right point, it might divest the gum of its native adhesiveness, it adhesiveness throughout, which would make it better than the native gum. Upon further trial with heat, he was further convinced of the correctness of this inference by finding that the India rubber could not be melted in boiling sulfur at any heat, but always charred. He made another trial of heating similar fabric before an open fire. This same of the same effect that of charring the gum followed. There were further indications of success in producing the desired result, as upon the edge of the charred position of the charred portion appeared a line or border that was not charred but perfectly cured. On ascertaining to a certainty that he had found the object of his search and much more, and that the new substance was proof against cold and the solvent of the native gum, he felt himself amply, re- amply repaid for the past and quite indifferent to the trials of the future. So not only is he writing this in the third person, but he also, he, the number of he's and his's in that yeah. little segment is a little bit absurd. Yeah, and, and I like this, he found this last he part. He, 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 he found himself amply repaid for the past, so all his bad luck, and then quite indifferent to the trials of the future, but he should not have been because his, his trials were only just beginning. Um, so he had come up with his revolutionary, and this, this is huge because if you think about it, even like, think of it like steam engines and car engines and stuff like this, they need the rubber for like, the, at the time, like the best gaskets people were using were like leather soaked in oil and stuff. And this was just not good for high pressure stuff like in car engines and like high pressure steam engines for being very efficient. And so like, you know, vulcanized rubber would like made some of this stuff for the industrial revolution, revolution like to really get going possible just and all this. Some of the things like replacing like rubber washers with yeah. leather in oil, <laughs> the disasters yeah. that would be had. 
Yeah. And I mean, it works good in low pressure to a certain extent, but high pressure stuff. And, and so, yeah, all this stuff and let alone all the products made of rubber and derivative materials. So, um, yeah, so he, Can you know, this is like a, the, the leather soaked in oil. <laughs> yeah, this is a world changing product that, you know, that he has come up with a way to make rubber. Actually, it's a lot stronger, not sticky. It's durable. It lasts. It lasts a really long time. It's, it's more uh it's not as susceptible to temperature change issues. I mean, it still is. I mean, if you get cold enough or hot enough, but uh, it's less so. Um, and yeah, it's this awesome product. Um, so he's quite indifferent to the trials of his future, but no. So this is good year. He's just got bad luck. Um, so 1840, so a year, the year after his world changing discovery, it was not a good year for, for him. He's, he's, so he's still fiddling at this point with the exact combination that makes the best version but he has come up with this really awesome version and he's still got the digestive issues and gout he's got gout now um so so he's and he's thinking he's gonna historical diseases (laughs) yeah Uh, he's just got to die of dysentery or whatever but so the fearing he would die he does wonder if he's nah he's not going to finish his life where he's again jailed this time because he couldn't pay a five dollar which is about 127 dollars today hotel bill and on top of that jail his it his infant son dies. Another kid dies. Uh, yeah. So he soldiers on by 1844. He comes up with and patents the optimal formula here. And, um, but this did not end his trouble because like we say, this is the time you patent something and you tell everyone how to do it. Then everyone's going to start making it and then just force you to sue them to actually, you know, you first, you have to find out they're making it, you know, infringing upon your patent, which, you know, at the time wasn't, wasn't like a matter of Googling it. You know, you quite often wouldn't find out that they were making money off your invention. And so he did, he ended up uh, 32 patent infringement cases and all that he had to pursue. Uh, at the same time, he decides to build a rubber factory because things, he seems like quite the optimist, like he's still way in debt but he's i'm going to build this rubber factory everything's going to be awesome because i have this revolutionary product but it wasn't he kind of overextended himself um so that didn't really work out for him either so he just kind of got more in debt um but he was making money now at least like he had a product legitimately people were people were you know he was actually bringing in some good money just you know he had massive amounts of debt which we'll get into when he dies how much he had even upon his death Uh um it was a massive amount um so so, (laughs) yeah it's big so yeah so his patent problems continue because he goes over to england and he's i'm going to patent in england because this is going to be great you know some major market over there and what he finds is that one thomas hancock coming in all back to thomas hancock has already patented Wait, it who's thomas and, hancock <laughs> thomas hancock is the guy who had the stagecoach business and made the rubber band the first uh, rubber bands yeah okay right yeah that guy so it turns out thomas hancock had already filed the patent and it turns out he even filed the patent before goodyear filed his u.s patent so how did thomas hancock wait for this know crazy how crazy random thing yeah how did thomas hancock and remember we we were talking about how Thomas Hancock was uh, was kind of worried about um, the the um, patent pirates, and the, this is kind of what he did a little bit. Except for he didn't need Goodyear's patent because he had a sample of Goodyear's uh, one of his sulfur. You know, before his patent was approved, he had a sample of this rubber, and he got it from a buddy of his, which. Um, We'll get to his buddy's name in a little bit. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But yeah, so... But has to work out how he did it. I mean... Exactly. But... And, and so this, this ensues. So when, so when Goodyear finds out about this, he, of course, you know, sues him. He's like, hey, this is actually mine. So this it's a, it's a whole... It's about a decade-long court battle, which is costing a lot of resources, too. Uh, which Goodyear's... Still, this is not how you want to spend your life. No. No. And especially when you're in debt and you just know, like, you invented this. Like, if they give you... If they accept it if the judge accepts it though he's going to get a massive windfall of money because all that money uh, hancock had been making off this and he was like a major like he's considered like the guy who founded the brit britain rubber industry you know um so they, i mean he was making massive amounts of money here and goodyear is entitled now to all of it just like a massive windfall and future revenue so goodyear really wants to win this this fight and uh, among all the other ones he was spending money on legal bills and stuff so he goes he finally after about a decade of this um he goes to and a british judge of course sides with the british hancock and he the, the judge says there's no way he could have figured out how to reproduce this uh just by examining a rubber that? hang on that's a bit of a coincidence then isn't it <laughs> yeah it is a bit of a coincidence and that he got the sample right before you know not long you know long before and then he comes up with a thing and for what it's worth and this is why goodyear is considered to be the guy who invented it rather than hancock even though hancock's patent was technically first uh, by a few weeks is all um so it turns out english inventor alexander parks who was friends with hancock and the other guy who uh william brock 
Bruckton, who actually brought the sample to um, Hancock. It was a buddy of his, and they worked on it together to try to figure out how, how Goodyear had done this. And Alexander Parks, who was the guy who invented the first man-made plastic, uh, he said Hancock and Brockton had both told him, yeah, they had Goodyear's sample, and they reverse engineered it. Like, it didn't take him that long to figure out how he had done it, because they knew, in the first place, they knew he was using sulfur and something and heat and stuff. They knew, like, the kind of the basic idea, so then it was a matter of just experimenting and re reversing exactly what he had put in this thing and... And even if you just know something's possible. Yeah, and you know you kind of the general it, formula. Sort of, yeah, even if you didn't. Yeah. Just because you yeah. know it can be done, it'd be like yeah. the alchemists were trying to make gold forever, even though they knew it could have, even though they had no idea that it could definitely be done. But if someone yeah. was like, yeah, here's the gold that we made through alchemy, then it'd be like, that is going to be a different game. <laughs> Yeah, no, and they not only knew that, they knew he was adding like heat and sulfur and in some way and come, it, like it didn't take him a long time. And there's various uh, chemical ways you can do this, like you can burn material and stuff to get to find out what it's made of and stuff like that. And so the exact composition. So there's, there's ways they can do it. But the judge was convinced the that it couldn't be done. Just yeah, being, he's uh, just like, yeah. <laughs> give the British guy the money, probably. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, this, they, they denied it. And um, Hancock, though, would, uh, would later say in separate, you know, after the court case that, that yeah, um, yeah, he was, he had this sample and, you know, he admitted he had the sample and they were looking at it. And uh, just a note to Brockton, uh, William Brockton, who, who was his buddy who brought him the sample, uh, was he actually came up with the vulcanized name. It was from Vulcan, the Roman god of fire. So referencing the heat added. So that's where, why we call it vulcanization was from Brockton. Um, but yeah, again, the Alexander Parks is like, no, no, they told me. They told me they used this sample. Um, so in any event. Uh, so yeah, Goodyear's credited though, historically, just because even though he was technically a few weeks after Hancock, just because it seems like Hancock just kind of ripped him off. So Goodyear, he, he was not lucky again. Uh, he, he lost that court case. So he's still, he's still working on his debts, you know, but things, things turned worse because in June of 1860, he's working, you know, doing his business. And he finds out yet another one of his children, this time one of his daughters, wow, is dying. How does he have? He had six or five, five or six total. So like most of them died. I mean, like all of them died eventually, but most of them died before he died. Oh. Um, like, so enough, he, two of his daughters are alive today. One is six yeah. years old. Yeah. So one of his daughters, he's dying. So he races to New York, but this is, this is good year. You know, he doesn't have good luck. So he gets there and he finds out she's already just oh. died. Uh, so he rides. And as, when he hears this news, he collapses right on the spot. He's then brought back to his hotel and he dies almost immediately thereafter uh in 1860 at the fifth age of 59 years old uh so yeah he he dies he's uh, approximately two hundred thousand dollars in debt at the time despite all this and that's about five million dollars today mm. yeah that's a lot <laughs> yeah so yeah, the guy i mean whole family in debt is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have probably these remaining surviving ones yeah, or yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. It was like the wife that he loved a great deal. She was imprisoned until she died. Yeah, and like she had to resort to prostitution or something, you know, just to make it work. But yeah, so anyways. So and but she was hung from a court. <laughs> <laughs> so good year. Good year though. He's a positive guy. You can tell kind of you know, there's he's yeah, just like, like the this. optimist, the yeah. eternal optimist, because even when he loses the the battle, the court battle with Hancock, his response is is the following quote. Life might punch you in the face, Malt, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Life should not be estimated exclusively by the standard of dollars and cents. I am not disposed to complain that I have planted and others have gathered the fruits. A man has cause for regret only when he sows and no one reaps. Yeah. That's very, like, very positive, good. Yeah, like I'm a pretty <laughs> positive guy. But yeah. that is yeah. 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 Just so long as someone's benefiting, you know, from my life's work, that's all I want. Um so yeah, so and you'll notice here a lot of people might be going, "What? Well, where? When did he start the tire company?" I was just and he didn't because yeah, I assume he didn't this whole thing that at some point he's going to start a big tire company and everything will work out okay. <laughs> no, that came um, in eighteen ninety eight. So it was that uh, th forty nine years after or forty eight uh -huh. years, whatever, uh, forty eight years after he died. Um, uh, 49 years, sorry. Uh, so he's no affiliation with the company. They just wanted to sort of honor him because, you know, for a lot of history, like when he died, he wasn't like well known or anything. Uh, he wasn't famous uh, like like more today, like for an adventure. He was quite unknown. And so this was just sort of to honor him, of, uh, you know, Charles Goodworth, so this Goodyear. So they, they just named the company after him. And I think they might have been in a town close by to one of them too that he was born. I can't remember exactly. Nice. But 
either way, going back to Hancock and rubber bands, because this is a story about rubber bands after all. So he didn't, he didn't ever patent his, uh, his rubber band making process. And so as, as Hancock is going through this decade long uh, lawsuit issue, this is hurting his own business, um, as you might imagine, because, you know, like even people buying stuff from him, is he going to win or is he going to lose? And, you know, like, I'm sorry, I have a completely random aside. But yeah. do you think that in like 200 years, people will be like, oh, yeah, the Tesla company founded by Nikola Tesla? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, think, totally. Hey, yeah. yeah, of course it's named after the guy who invented rubber. <laughs> what are the odds of it being anything other than that? Yeah. Well, in this case, it won't because there'll be like uh, colonization on Mars and Elon Musk will have had something to do with that. And so people will remember Elon Musk, who didn't actually found Tesla, by the way, but he, everyone true, thinks yeah. he did. Uh, no one remembers the guys who actually, but he, he, of course, is the guy who made it a thing and made it not go bankrupt a million times. And now, <laughs> you know, doing awesome. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, everyone's going to be like, that Tesla. Tesla was that <laughs> yeah, car what a great right? guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, 1850s, Hancock, he's, his business, is, I mean, it's still doing well. He's not like Goodyear or anything. Um, so, but it did cost him quite a bit. Uh, and he, a lot of his competitors started popping up as he's going through these legal battles and having trouble with all this. And including, going back to even before the legal battles were... Um, one moment, because we already mentioned all this. Including because uh, in 1845, some of these legal battles are all still going, when Stephen Perry figures out, hey, those rubber bands you made, now that we have vulcanized rubber, like these are actually super useful. And so he patents his own thing. So he was working for Messrs. Perry and Co. Rubber Manufacturing of London. And he patents the improvements in springs to be applied to girths, belts, and bandages and improvements in the manufacture of elastic bands. Do you use Messrs. Is... in America? No. But, this is uh, so old school. Like the a teacher at school used to, when he would address multiple boys, he would call them messes. And then also mm -hmm. a friend of mine from school is called Perry. So it'd always be like messes Perry, Whistler, and Sagrot see me after assembly. See, I don't really know this from like Harry Potter. <laughs> so, oh, there you go. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like Messrs. Mooney, Padfoot, and Prawns or whatever. Like, um, <laughs> kind of similar um, to you know, school, school boys. But, um, in any event, so he patents these and rubber bands is one of the things. And for he, he found them really useful for holding papers together. And so in the patent, though, he did actually explicitly distance himself from the, in the ongoing vulcanized rubber thing uh, going on because he didn't want his patent to be tied to that in any way. So he just, he just notes in it. Improvements in springs to be applied to girths. Nope, uh, nope, no, nope. I'm reading the wrong. There's so many quotes <laughs> today, dude. Uh, we yeah. make no claim to the preparation of the India rubber herein mentioned. Our invention consisting of springs of such preparation of India rubber applied to the articles herein mentioned and also of particular forms of elastic bands made from such manufacture of India rubber. <laughs> How many yeah, so he's definitely India rubber and herein mentioned? <laughs> mentioned yeah, so he does... <laughs> He basically wants to say you could use any rubber for this, even though if you use non-vulcanized rubber, it's not going to be an effective rubber band. Uh, but, you know, he's like, it doesn't matter. But it does matter, but everyone would use the vulcanized rubber after. So in any event, so he found it. But it's still, this was something mostly just used by businesses and in factories and warehouses and stuff, uh, rather than it wasn't like a common household item until one William Spencer of Alliance, Ohio, uh, sometime in 1923. So this is fast forwarding a bit. Um, so he's getting the, the Akron Beacon Journal, the local newspaper, you know, they leave it out. But before they rubber banded it, you know, before these times, the, the, they would just oh, blow yeah. away, like Everything. the pages would just, would just blow away. Um, which is kind of funny to think about, like no one thought to, to do anything about that. So he did, he thought, hey, so Goodyear Rubber Company was, was nearby, funny enough. Um, yeah, that's what it was, Akron. Akron is where the Goodyear Company was, was founded. You know, um, I, sorry, I know I've got like a million asides to <laughs> Yeah, well this whole episode thinking, is like a one big aside. <laughs> it is. I was just thinking, I, when, I, when I was a kid, I used to work in a news agent, right? You know, that delivers the newspapers places. Yeah. So the paper boys would come in and they'd grab all these things. We don't use elastic bands. What do you use? They're not wrapped up. They just go direct in people's post boxes. Yeah. That Is that works. actually a thing? Like, I know in the movies, the paper uh -huh. boy rides through the suburbs and uh -huh. he has the newspapers in a basket and he throws them. Does that actually happen? 
I don't know if that's still a thing, but I was a paper boy at one point. And yes, we weren't allowed to throw them like that. Uh, we had to actually go put them on the doorstep. Uh, but you did, you know, do it, you know, you just ride your bike up real quick and plop it down and go to the next place. And um, yeah, and, and they, they would actually leave, uh, in our case, at least there was this old refrigerator that was just like out in the middle of this like field. And this was the spot they would put okay. all the newspapers. And then we would, we would wrap, we would wrap them if it was raining, we'd put them in plastic bags and um, everything. So they would just leave like the big old stack. And then our, it was the next stage was for us to pick them up, rubber band them, oh put them in the sacks or whatever, and then go deliver them. But yeah, that was the thing. We didn't throw them. I don't know. We weren't supposed to do that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, to put them in letterboxes by us. <laughs> yeah, well, that makes that makes sense. Um, it's more work, though. So. Yeah. So, but anyways, going back to William Spencer of Alliance Ohio. So he, Goodyear Rubber Company. There he goes, and he start. He says, "Hey, can I have some of your like discarded, like discarded rubber pieces, like uh, inner inner tubes and stuff like that that they were just kind of like being thrown out?" And so then he cuts these into circular strips. And then begins to wrap the newspapers and then he goes to the Akron Beacon Journal and says, hey, check this out. This is way better. See how it just holds the papers together. Now you won't have them blowing all over the place. And they thought that was a great idea too. Though. So they started buying these rubber bands from him. They still do they was making. in some places. I went on a, a few years ago, I took a motorcycle trip in Cambodia in Asia. Mm -hmm. And like I needed something to attach my bag onto like the back of my mm -hmm. motorcycle. And yeah. so I went to buy some, uh, do you call them bungee cords? Like the yeah, yeah sure yeah, yeah and they just made them out of old tires so they'd be stripping tires oh. into long pieces like making wires on the ends and then you could like use mm -hmm. them to tie stuff on yeah so, yeah like, and so this is old tires yeah this is what he did and he actually worked uh, unlike other people you know who would just quit their day job and just all right I'm going full bore he continued working at the Pennsylvania Railroad for I think it was up to like a decade while he was doing this building up his his side rubber band business which Alliance if people probably notice where, where he was from uh at the Alliance is actually um the, the the biggest rubber band manufacturer in the world today um so by 1944 is when it really started to um to really pick up and he opened a second factory. So at this point he had quit his day job and uh, he opened a second factory. And then uh, he designed and patented in 1957 an even better, the Alliance rubber band, which is sort of the world, uh, world rubber band standard today. And they, they make over 14 million pounds of rubber bands per year nowadays, the Alliance rubber company. But all this newspaper inspiration, just people, newspapers blowing away in the wind. Um, and that is the main part of our thing, but we have a bonus fact today. Ooh, just because today's yeah. episode is not long enough. <laughs> yeah, not, or not random enough. So a lot of people in, independently invented the uh, Silly Putty, but there was actually a few people uh, that did it. But one, James Wright is generally given the credit for actually inventing it because he is the one who invented the one that you was know, ultimately popularized. We have Silly Putty in the UK, but I don't think I've ever had it. Really, it used to be able to do. You could do all sorts of. I mean, you're like bounce. It's like a bouncy ball. Obviously, stick things. Um, NASA used it for a while before Velcro to stick things in their in their like a. I think like Apollo Eight or something. They brought so it's just brought like it up. A putty that you can form into shapes. Yeah, you can form into shapes. It bounces, but also in the old days, you could also do newspapers or pages. Certain pages, um, you could put it on there, lift it off, and the ink would come off on the thing, and then you could press the thing on a piece of paper and make a copy. Like it, it's like a, it's versatile. You can do cool. Yeah, you can't always do that nowadays because they use different inks and stuff now than they used to. I think it can still be done sometimes, but it doesn't quite work as well. I think on most cases, but it used to. It used to one that I really wanted as a kid, and it was, it was like silly putty. But if you smashed it with a hammer, or like smashed it on the surface, it would break like uh, like glass. Oh, and then it would all come back together. Like you could merge it back together. It was just some sort of weird property of it. Um, oh. I've never tried that with Silly Putty, so I wouldn't think I wouldn't think it was that one, but that's kind of cool. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was cool. So, uh, 1943, how did he come up with it? He was working for General Electric's new in their New Haven, Connecticut lab. Mm -hmm. And so they were, obviously, the Allies were super short on rubber because Japan had invaded, invaded various uh, rubber-producing countries, the Pacific Rim, so there was a rubber shortage, and they needed it for war efforts. So the U.S. government uh, was just, like, throwing money at the problem, giving major companies like hey we need a synthetic rubber and we need it like now budgeted <laughs> yeah we're just well, here's infinite supply make it because we really need this and so that one of his attempts he mixed boric acid with silicon oil and it came up with silly putty and he couldn't actually figure out he called it nutty putty um so he couldn't figure out the name isn't it 
Yeah, I think so. We'll we'll get how it became silly putty in a moment, but um, so yeah, he couldn't figure out any use for it. He tried all sorts of stuff. Couldn't. So then he sent samples off all over to scientists all all over the world, uh, allied scientists, obviously, um, and and say like, could you can you can you figure this out? Like, is there a way to make? Because it is kind of a rubber like product, and is there a way something additive, or can you? Is there another? you know, useful use for it. And nobody could come up with anything. And so for six years, it sort of languished from 1943 to 1949 in obscurity. Uh, but, but parties, it was like a party thing, cocktail parties. Like if you could get a hold of it, like if you were one of the people who had the samples or, you know, they, making it uh, local there uh, at their little lab, um, which we'll get into later, some of 3M stuff, the 3M labs, like they, they're cool stuff. Like, and they just, they just play with like at the labs, they have so much, such cool products that they just sort of play with that, you know, that some of them eventually became big things, but they were either way. So this blue and the uh, post-it notes and all the post-it cool notes, stuff, right? post-it notes is super interesting how many years it took for that to become a thing. Uh, but yeah, so yeah. So people would, would play with it. Incredible when you think about it compared to all other glues that you know about. Yeah, it was this useless product that ever, it was again a situation like that where it was like, hey, what can we do with this? And they're like, nothing, it's a crappy glue. Like, what, you, can't, you can't do anything with it. And even when he did figure out you could do something with it, uh, still management was like, no, that's stupid. Even though internally it was used within the company quite a bit. And then when they released it, nobody wanted it. Uh, they thought it was stupid. But anyways, that's a story for another day. So eventually at one of these parties, when Ruth Falgetter, she is a, a toy store owner called the, uh, the toy store was the block shop. And she, was like, hey, uh, with, along with one Peter Hodgson, which is a marketer, uh, hey, we'll put this in my toy catalog and we'll sell it and we'll call it Bouncing Putty. And uh, it actually ended up being the second best selling item in her catalog behind Crayola Crayons. Hey, uh, was, it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it gets brought, brought around even more in a bit. But um, yes, yeah, so. Hodgson at the time was deeply in debt, $12,000 oh, in debt. Back around. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll get there. $176,000 today. That's how much in debt this guy was. And so he decides to buy more of this putty and he wants to also buy. So he, he borrows money to then buy the production rights to it. And he renames it Silly Putty. And so he then hires Yale College students because it's around Easter at the time. Mm -hmm. So he hires them to put it in eggs. And this is why Silly Putty is always, well, almost always sold in, in little plastic eggs because it was around Easter when he first wanted to market and he was going to sell it for a dollar each. And uh, he got, he ended up getting the Talk of the Town New York article published on it, which helped uh, reasonably close to Easter. And uh, it became like huge, nascent ride, 250,000 units sold in the first three days, which first off, how do you go from nothing what? to manufacturing yeah, 250? 50,000 units. <laughs> yeah, like when those orders roll in, may, you know, Yale College students, I guess. Uh, so, and then first year, first Where'd year, he sold all the plastic eggs. Where'd you get all the actual raw materials? Yeah. How did this guy? He may have been a marketer, but he also clearly had some sort of like, because yeah, it's hard to as a scale up and six million units in the first year at a dollar an egg. And just for put that in for a second, that's $86 million today in today's Hell money yeah. of gross sales in his first year. So he's not in debt anymore. And uh, so, Silly Putty ultimately purchased by none other than Binny and Smith in 1977, yeah, the, a year after yeah. Hodgins died. Dead yeah, and so... The entire Crayola company, right? Yeah, Crayola company. And so, yeah, they purchased Silly Putty in 1977. And Hodgins' net worth upon his death was about $140 million today, almost solely based on Silly Putty. That's about $700 million in today's money. Good um, Lord. Wait. So 140 million then, 700 million. Yeah, then, and then $700 million today is what that is. Ah, uh, mostly cool. on Silly Putty. On, on just a few decades of Silly Putty sales uh, is what he had. And that is our show today. Legends. Dude, this, well, this guy's ending was a lot happier. Right? I know. He, yeah. And he didn't, but again, he's not the guy who made the Silly Putty in the first place. The guy invented it. He's just a marketer who came along and saw the potential of it and, you know, made it happen. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Yeah. Execution. Yeah. Implement it. And, and honestly, executing to go from zero to 253,000 units in three days and yeah. then six million six units, million that's, million that's, that's kind of impressive a little bit. Yeah. No, um, I say he deserves that 700 million. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it's a simple thing. You got plastic eggs, people probably easily bought in mass, especially around Easter. And then it's not like the products used to make silly putty or, you know, rare or anything and easily mixed. So I mean, but still, still. just the, the logistics, logistics of it all. Impressive. Wait, so just the maths on that, right? So he's got yeah. three days to produce. I mean, presumably he bought like, 
he had like, I'm sure he didn't think he was going to sell 250,000. So I'm sure he didn't pre make that many. Um, so yeah, but <laughs> so if you, um, let's say it took him a day to realize it was going to be incredibly popular <laughs> from that moment, yeah. he needed to be making 86 a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, getting people to package them, put the buddy in and everything. Yeah, that's crazy. Incredible. All right. Yeah. Um, everybody, if you enjoyed our show today, you can support it by supporting our fantastic sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare.com forward slash brain food. Two months for free. It's a good thing to do. Also, uh, why not support our show in a different way if you want to do that as well? Is to leave us a review. Once we get to a thousand reviews on American iTunes, we're going to go through all of the iTunes and all of the various different pod- podcast apps, not all of the tiny ones that no one's ever heard of, but the big ones. And we're going to choose someone to randomly win an Amazon gift voucher of a thousand dollars to uh, celebrate the thousand reviews. So that's what we're going to do. Leave us a review, honest review, however you feel this show does. That's what we would like. Well, no, we'd like <laughs> a five star review, but. Give but good, that. helpful feedback is also good, even if it is five star. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's our show. I really hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back shortly at some point yeah. this month, I guess. Yeah, and we have a we have a way we're going to try to make it so it's like a regular thing, which we'll announce at some point. <laughs> yes, that would be good. We'll announce that coming very soon. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching, depending on how you consume yeah. this content. Oh. <laughs> Bye.